And I invite you to join me as well in a prayer. Gracious God, as we journey through this life, remind us of the gifts that you give each and every day, some of which come in such ordinary ways that they're easy to miss, and others which can only be perceived by faith. And as the world looks, they may not see gifts at all. Give us that heavenly perspective. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A few weeks ago, uh, as we were reading from 2 Corinthians, we came across that little phrase that says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. What do we walk by? Faith. And not by? Sight. Which means that sometimes in our day-to-day -day lives, what our eyes tell us, what our ears tell us, what our human experience tells us may not actually be what is. Huh? For example, it's really easy, you tell me, is it easy -er <laughs> to feel blessed by God when you have a healthy bank account or an unhealthy one? Is it easy to feel blessed of God when your health is robust or when your health is really struggling? Is it easy to see the blessings of God when things are going well by our standards or when things kind of stink? If you answered A to any of those questions, you know what it is to walk by sight. We all do that. It's natural. It's normal. But it may not always be. It doesn't always mean that our eyes are lying to us or our ears are lying to us or our minds or our hearts are lying to us or even that the newspaper is lying to us. But what we see may not always be what God would have us perceive. We walk by faith, not by sight, Paul says. Well, I want to take that concept with you a little bit more this morning. Now to the book of Ephesians. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to open to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to start at verse 3. If you don't have a Bible handy, just open up in your bulletin. You'll find it printed right in the middle of page 5. And the reason I want you to find that is because we're going to read it together in a couple different ways, okay? So would you start reading with me? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Now, I don't know if you were counting or not, but there were six sentences in that section of Scripture. It's a little deceiving 
because if you were to go back and open up to the original Greek, it's one sentence. So now, using only one breath, let's try to read this one sentence together. No, you don't want to try? Let's, let's see how far we can get. You ready? We'll take a, a you know, cleansing breath. Right? Okay, here we go. Ready? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. See, I'm not the only long-winded person here. Some of you could outdo me. Yes, the musicians, of course, might have not had difficulty, but I don't imagine any of us could get through that in one breath. So, don't be offended if this morning we can't get through in one sermon. But we're going to try. No. <laughs> Would you put the first slide up? I'm uh, indebted this morning to a colleague of mine, uh, whose funeral I attended this past week. Uh, he had began a sermon series on Ephesians this summer and uh, had commented to some of us in an email. Um, so thank you, Todd, uh, for some insights today. What I've done, and if you want in your bulletin or in your Bible, you might want to underline or circle these words to notice what Paul is telling us happens because of Jesus. Okay? As he starts out, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who has blessed us, what's it say? In Christ with what? Every spiritual blessing, huh? You have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Now, do you see that all the time? Do I see it all the time? I don't. In fact, I could probably come up with a prayer right now off the top of my head in a whole bunch of ways that I would like to see God bless me and bless you. And that's not bad. But I wonder sometimes if I pray that kind of prayer, if you pray that kind of prayer, if other people pray that kind of prayer, if God doesn't just sort of tap a chin or a cheek and say, well, don't you see? <laughs> you already have been. Blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now notice, spiritual blessing, not earthly blessing, not material blessing. And in fact, notice the rest of this phrase, where the spiritual blessings can best be seen. In the heavenly places. Which seems to me to be an encouragement for us to pray not so much for blessing, but to pray, God, help me have an eternal perspective. Help me to have a heavenly perspective. Help me to see with my earthly eyes what you see and what you have done. Every spiritual blessing in Christ, right? Well, it goes on to say, start reading in verse 4, just as he chose us, where? In Christ. You and I are chosen, but we are chosen in Christ. When were you chosen? After you had accomplished enough good? After it looked like your life had potential? After you had done enough good to outweigh the bad? What's it say? Does it say any of that? No. When? Before the foundation of the world. In other words, before you and I were even around. Folks, that's grace, isn't it? That's what Martin Luther and so many of the other reformers wanted to grab a hold of. To say, look, it's grace. It's not what we do. In fact, before you and I could even do anything, Paul tells us God chose us in Christ. Huh? Before the foundation of the world. And how does he want us to be? 
Keep reading. What's it say? Holy and blameless before him in love. Right? This is why the scriptures are so full of calls for you and I to live in righteousness for you and I to live in the way God created us to live. Not to get God to love us. We can't do that. But because he loves us, we've been destined to live that way. And when we don't live that way, we're walking out of our destiny. And God doesn't want that, you see. Because we've been chosen, right? In fact, speaking of destiny, what's it say in verse 5? He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, we may have to chew on this for, for a while. And I, I'm, I'm even hesitant sometimes to say this kind of stuff in a sermon because it takes much more dialogue and conversation. But just because a person is a human being does not make them a child of God. We're destined through Christ as children of God. Remember, perhaps, those words in the opening chapter of the Gospel of John, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of the people. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. And then it goes on to say, And the word became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. And it's in that same section that it goes on to say, For as many as believed in him, he gave power to become the children of God. We are destined through Christ to become God's children, according to his good pleasure, it says, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us. Where again? Look how it ends. In the beloved. Look in these just few verses. Paul keeps pointing us. It's in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. If we're looking for blessings anyplace else, we're not going to find them. Next slide, please. See how it starts? In Him, we have redemption. We don't have redemption in our good works. We don't have redemption in what anybody else may have done for us. It's in Him, in Christ, in Jesus, and in fact, as it ends in that phrase, through His blood. See, grace is free, but it costs interesting sometimes. In our faith, we have these tension points. Grace is incredibly free, but it costs. It cost the Son everything. He gave it up for us. Which is why we used a portion of Martin Luther's statement of faith this morning in our service. When he talks about what he has done for us in Jesus, he goes on to say, at great cost, <laughs> he has saved and redeemed me, a lost and condemned person. Through his blood, what do we receive? The forgiveness of our trespasses. Now think about this for a minute. Another picture of grace. If you were to take a timeline and put you and I on that timeline today and we simply called it the present, where on the timeline would be the cross? In the present, in the future, or in the past? In the past, in the past right? How many say in the past? Non-trick question, great time to raise your hand. In the past. Which means Jesus died for your sins when? In the past, before you and I ever did them. Right? So, our sins have already been paid for. Not only the sins that we committed this morning, maybe even the ones you're doing right now, <laughs> or the ones before today, but even the ones that are going to happen after. So what the heck? Let's go out and sin all we want because they're going to be forgiven. Are you crazy, Paul says? That's not what it's about, right? 
But again, the forgiveness of our sins happened in the past. That's when that forgiveness was given. And it, it says, according to the riches of His grace that He lavished on us. Now, I bet lavish is not a word you used in this past week. Now, I got to be at a wedding feast yesterday. It was not... It was good, but it wasn't lavish. Lavish is a buffet, right? No, no, not really. I mean... <laughs> but, you know, I mean, just... I mean, we don't even use that kind of word. Sometimes you go to uh, an, a historical site and you see the way the kings, you know, or, or great uh, leaders, you know, the big, I mean, lavish. It's just this incredible word. God lavished His grace upon us. We got to keep going. You want to get home eventually. With all wisdom and insight, it says, He has made known to us the mystery of His will. Interesting. The mystery of His will. Now mystery by definition is something that you and I can't fully comprehend or understand. And yet it says here that He has revealed it to us. He has made known to us the mystery of His will. But remember, no matter how much growth you and I might have spiritually, and by God's grace we get to do that in this life. No matter how much growth we have spiritually, we don't even get close to the wisdom of God. And so when you and I look to God from our perspective, whether it's, you know, teeny tiny baby Christian or working our way along to being a grown-up Christian, we're going to see mystery. It's not always going to make sense. It's not always going to be something we can figure out. And that's okay. But again, as you'll see, it's in Christ that we get enough of a picture of what God is up to that we can keep moving forward, right? Because it says, He has made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He set forth in Christ. Verse 10, read with me. As a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. What's the mystery? You see it in verse 10? That in the fullness of time, God will gather up all things in Christ. It may not always make sense. We may not always be able to figure it out. It may not be easy. It may not be pleasant. It may not be something we would wish on ourselves or anybody else. But somehow, some way, we hold fast to the promise that God is at work in this world, in the midst even of human history and activity, Bringing His will to fulfillment. We may not see it. We may not be able to figure it out. But in that fullness of time, it will come. And it will be apparent. Next slide. For your sake, almost the last slide. One more. Again, notice how it starts. In Christ, we have obtained an inheritance. When you get an inheritance... When somebody dies, right? We've obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. Hear that mystery again? We may look at that and say, good Lord, how can we talk about the will of God in that situation? But Scripture tells us that God's at work so that we who were first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of His glory. Last slide. In Christ, or in Him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in Him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. That is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of His glory. Now go back to the first slide, would you, Tim? It's kind of interesting. Blessed be the God and Father, right? Next slide. In Him, the Son. Last slide. 
the Holy Spirit. See it? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In fact, you take this home and read it some more. You'll see each time it talks about praising the Father, praising the Son, praising the Holy Spirit. The one God. Huh? Mystery, remember? God is at work in grace. We may not be able to always see it with our earthly eyes, which is why the Scripture calls us to have a heavenly perspective, which is why the Scripture calls us to walk by faith, not by sight, but captured and swimming in that grace of God and called to extend that grace to others. Wow. Let it be. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all...